the next set of issues we really want to talk about in these training materials have to do with collaborations. And it seems strange to think, well, this is a program about research infrastructures. So why the focus on collaborations? But in an earlier unit, we were talking about how research infrastructures exist at scale. And one of the things that differentiates them from other tools or other projects is exactly this scale. And when you reach a certain scale, you can't do it all yourself. So you have to collaborate. So talking about collaborations within infrastructures and how collaboration really becomes a norm and a driving factor for a research infrastructure is quite important. So the first question to ask is, do you collaborate? If you're a humanist scholar, you work on, I don't know, 19th century French poetry, do you collaborate? And if you do, how? And if you don't, well, why not? And I think that one of the challenges that we have when we talk about collaboration amongst humanists, I'm talking more about humanists than digital humanists now, is that some of what we understand under collaboration is somewhat alien to their modes of, of work, whereas other things that are indeed modes of working with others are very much embedded in what they do, but wouldn't necessarily be recognized as collaboration. So if we think about the amount of time and the amount of of knowledge processing that happens in activities like teaching, conferences, mentoring, peer reviewing, research visits, blogging, social media, um, using online communities and other kinds of online interaction. You start to see that there is a lot of interaction there, but it might be what John Unsworth calls cooperative rather than collaborative. So the question, if we're starting from the fundamentals of how collaboration influences research infrastructure, if we look at this as a difference in the way humanists collaborate, it leads us to the question of whether digital humanists change this in degree or kind, and of course whether infrastructure scale development changes this in degree or kind. So for many people, for many people who work on collaboration, there's this idea of real collaboration which would be multidisciplinary and which would be manifested largely in things like co-authorship and lab style work. That collaboration occurs when you sit together and you publish together. So if we look at classical definitions of collaboration, however, we see that this is not necessarily a, a part of the definition that needs to be defended. So Jaswal and, and Sashtal call it the coming together of diverse interests and people to achieve a common purpose via interactions, information sharing, and coordination of activities. I, I like this because I think the diversity is important to collaboration. And it is, of course, one of the sources of tension in collaboration. But how that actually works, I think, is something we need to, make, to leave open. And in terms of digital humanities and digital humanities research infrastructure. Um, if we look at this quote from Melissa Terrace, which I find, again, captures quite a bit of, of what I think we need to understand and where we need to start. Digital humanities must be collaborative, so also must DH infrastructure. But the range of interests encompassed by digital humanities is broad, covering resource development, specific research questions and methods, evaluation, policy, standards, teaching, and software development, among others. So again, we have to recognize that the collaboration is there, and it must be a part of what's there. And it is about diversity, and it must be about diversity. But how exactly that collaboration is developed is something we need to leave open and actually understand in a very broad way as being quite multifaceted. So if we look at digital humanities as inherently collaborative, because when you bring together the humanities knowledge and you want that at a high level, and the library science knowledge, the knowledge of how you work with collections, and that too needs to be at a high level, and then you have the computer science, which also needs to be at a high level, no individual or very rare individuals only can understand it all. And if you can't know it all, you can't do it all. So you have to work together. And of course, once we get to an infrastructure scale, all of these things get sort of blown open to a major level. So I would say that digital humanities research infrastructure development is not only collaborative, it's massively collaborative. So on the, the idea of having impact, 
you're going to have a public value for money, you're going to have a non-academic use, you're going to have a whole impact debate coming in there. And you're also going to have a library science set of questions about access to sources, about reuse of standards, about discoverability. In the humanities domain, we're going to have the institutional buy-in, the researchers as users, but also peer respect. Because if you don't have that peer respect, no infrastructure will be a place that any researcher will do any serious work. And then finally, from a computer science point of view, the computer science under, underpinning all of this should be cutting edge, it should be sustainable. And of course, you need to get the right people in to work on this. So there's a recruitment question as well. So this very, very broad level of collaborative questions and collaborative forces really drive what happens in a research infrastructure. So needless to say, Many people have been looking at collaboration in the digital humanities and in research infrastructure for many years. And what's interesting is you find in an early phase of that, kind of in the, the 80s and the 90s, but also into the early 2000s, and of course this has residents beyond, you find a lot of models being taken directly from management science. So to look at this massive scale of collaboration as a management task. So you find work about relationship level versus task level, successes and failures, uh, conflicts between researcher quality goals and organizational efficiency goals, the lack of common vocabularies, cultural differences, the importance of leadership, um, the cost of insufficient attention being paid to processes, management structure, or role clarity. Any of these aspects could equally well have been researched in a standard management context. But the fact that they were being applied to digital humanities labs and teams meant that there was a professionalization happening within the community. Now, as I mentioned, this tradition does con continue, and there's a lot of very, very good work coming out there. Um, but it's relevant also across this wide set of work contexts. So for example, um, problems related to team members' physical proximity. Those of us who spend a lot of time in Skype calls would have a, have a sense of, of, of how this can be a, a challenge within these sort of distributed teams. Again, did digital humanities or the digital humanities research infrastructure invent the distributed team? Of course not. But do we find ourselves working this way very often? Yes, we do. So what a lot of this comes down to, however, is that within these distributed teams, these large teams that make up research infrastructures, we constantly come up to questions of trust. And I think this is someplace where the, the research infrastructure and the digital humanities research infrastructure can make a particular um, intervention and where it is particularly important because trust is something that all I think all high-performing teams probably need and this has to do with the alignment of a number of, of, of really sort of deep set aspects of attitudes of values and benefits and mutual respects and hierarchies and expectations and when you look at the diversity again this idea of diversity being a part of collaboration of the concerns of the experience of the cultures, and I mean cultures not just in terms of national cultures, but in terms of a library science or information science culture, a computer science culture, a humanities discipline culture. When you look at when these cultures come together, it can be challenging. And I really love this quote that I found in one of the wonderful articles by Lynn Siemens. We're very service oriented, but we don't want that to be confused with servitude. So there is this kind of tension there that when you have these different um, cultures and these different levels of knowledge and experience coming together, how do you create a parity of esteem? How do you create a basis of trust that's going to allow this project or this infrastructure to develop and flourish? So there are a series of possible failure points and solutions. Um, and I was told once that every problem is a management problem. So if you're a leader of a research infrastructure, this is the kind of thing you need to be very aware of. Because you will often have, and again, if you boil down the literature, you'll find gaps in imagination, something you didn't see coming, or gaps in dialogue, something that perhaps different people saw coming in a different way. And all of these gaps converge in a very specific digital humanities uh, discourse about collaboration, where there's a lot of work about the need for translators, the need for people in the middle. So, these people have different names. They've been called intermediaries, translators, hybrid people, cyber infrastructure facilitators, which is one of my favorites, um, or data X. And this is where it's quite interesting, where we again see the work in the digital humanities having a very wide resonance because the data manager, the data steward, the data 
um, the data curator, all of that starts to come in and starts to fill this sort of gap where if we have different uh, ideas of uh, or different kind of stakes coming together, different people with different priorities and looking for potentially different things out of this multifaceted research infrastructure. Um, this whole idea that there needs to be people in the middle to make sure that we don't lose the um, uh, ability to see or the ability to manage the, the conflicts that may come up. But <clears throat> there's been some, some work done recently that's, that's showed us a lot about how if we can create a common and agreed ground for success and progress, we will move forward um, in, in sort of staggering steps. Um, this structure and progress has to be based on something very, um, uh, that, that, that is again at the level of the belief, at the level of values, and this is again going back to this question of trust. And I think, for example, this work here, um, the recent uh, massive ethnographic study of digital humanists is amazing for what it does, but also what it does is it's already looking at the tip of an iceberg. It's looking at how humanists encounter and how they bring in digital tools. And I would say that if we want to get deeper into collaboration, we need to get deeper into the cultures we're bringing together. Um, I'm a firm believer in the idea of epistemic cultures. We're taught to create knowledge. We're taught to imbue knowledge with a sense of authority in different ways, depending on how we're trained. And so we need to actually be able to pull that out and pull that information up into the collaboration so that we can actually speak a common dialogue uh, with our collaborators who are coming from a di completely different space. And that's where the next couple of units are going to, to go forward and looking at a couple of the spaces that are very key for the humanities research infrastructure and how we might better inform and influence that dialogue um, going in the development of research infrastructures.